Hey, my name is Enon. I have uh, Anoop here with me. We both work for uh, Traceable AI. And today we're going to talk about uh, API security. Do you want to introduce yourself, Anoop? Hey, morning, guys. Evening, afternoon, wherever you're joining from. Um, yeah, uh, super excited to have this conversation with you guys. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll be, like Enon mentioned, uh, Talking about API security, showing uh, showing how Traceable can help you with API security as well. Cool. Thank you, Anu. So the first part of the presentation is going to be more about the API security field. And then Anu is going to show you some information about uh, how API security problems can be solved and how Traceable can help you with that. So let me share my screen. Cool. Uh, so the main topic today is, as I mentioned, API security and the OWASP top 10 for APIs. Uh, basically, we're going to talk about some traditional application security uh, uh, versus modern application security and try to understand what changed in the last five years in the field of application security. We're going to talk about the biggest challenge of uh, API security, which is authorization. And then we're going to uh, jump into the OWASP top 10 for APIs, which is the top 10 uh, vulnerabilities list for API security. And to see some uh, real world examples, how big companies got breached because of API vulnerabilities. So just a few words about myself. Let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Inon Shkeli. I'm the head of security research at Traceable AI. Uh, I got around eight or nine years of experience with application security, and I grew up with APIs. So what does this mean? Basically, I started my career back in Israel. I used to be part of the red team of the Israeli army, and I used to perform a lot of pen tests for uh, organizations in the field of government, military, and finance. So as you can imagine, those organizations are heavily based on older technologies like Java, ASP.NET, and SAP, and very old concepts like uh, multi-page applications, on-prem environments, waterfall, and uh, they didn't have so many APIs. API used to be just like a kind of a niche component, mostly for B2B communication, like SOAP and stuff like that. So after serving for five years in the, in the Israeli army, I decided to, to buy a one-way ticket and I moved to the Silicon Valley in California. And in the last uh, four years, I've been providing consultation for a startup and T1 companies. And I got exposed to a new, a new field of technologies like Ruby on Rails, Node.js, Elixir. And all of them are based on very modern concepts like single page applications, cloud environments, CI CD. And the most important uh, part is that all of these technologies are heavily based on APIs. So APIs are no longer just a niche component between a, for a B2B communication. Today, it's the backbone of the application. And this is a very big change. And the next thing that I figured out after I moved to, uh, to the Silicon Valley is that if I want to stay relevant in this field and to keep finding vulnerabilities in this type of applications, I have to adapt my mindset. I have to understand how API security looks like. So before we jump into API security, I would like to talk with you about the differences between traditional applications, uh, web servers, and modern APIs. So if we, if we take a look at the screen, at the top part, you can see how the traffic and the traffic pattern uh, used to look like in traditional applications. So first of all, the client would send a simple HTTP call to ask for a specific page, in this case, the home page. And then the web server would uh, fetch data from the database, usually a SQL server. Uh, and based on this data, would render the visual page to the client. Rendering is the mechanism to create a visual page and serve it back to the client in the form of HTML page. It used to be pretty simple. And the clients used to be not very uh, sophisticated just to present the HTML page to the user. Today, it looks very different. First of all, clients, clients know exactly what they need. Today, uh, your, your browser, your mobile client, 
ask for specific pieces of information from the API. For example, fetch the last 10 notifications or uh, give me updates from the last five hours and stuff like that. Clients know much better what they want. And then the web servers simply fetch data from the databases and you have more types of databases. Um, and instead of rendering the visual page and uh, bring it back to the client, they used as kind of a proxy between the client and the database. They just return raw data into the client in the format of JSON. And it's the responsibility of the client to, uh, to create this visual page. So the rendering mechanism moved from the backend to the client, which is a very important change, especially if we talk about uh, application security. A few more differences. Uh, first of all, you have uh, many more types of clients and they are much more powerful. On top of the browsers, you can find IoT devices, you can find mobile devices, and even other developers that use, their, uh, that use the API to develop their own applications. And APIs expose less abstraction layers. It took me some time to understand what it means, less abstraction layers, because many people say it, but uh, what it means, it's actually, uh, it's a few different things, but the main one is that the clients, servers, and sometimes even databases speak the same language, language of JSON. So um, the JSON receipt object processed by your client, by your uh, Uber client, for example, might be the same exact JSON object that's processed by the Uber API, which is a big difference. It means that there are less abstraction layers and it's much easier for the clients to talk with the database, with the server. If we talk about uh, DevOps, so there is bad news and good news. The bad news, it's, it's like the good news, it's classic IT issues like open ports, old versions of uh, operating systems, stuff like that, barely exist because today, many times, in many cases, the cloud provider manages it for you. The bad news is it's really hard to keep on track with API, which leads to shadow APIs. Uh, from the application security perspective, uh, there are many vulnerabilities that no longer exist in APIs, or it's really hard to find them. Like SQL injections uh, don't exist, uh, I mean, only in some uh, rare cases, because many developers today use ORM environments that uh, prevent SQL injections by design. If we talk about XXC, which is a vulnerability in the processing of XMLs, today it doesn't really come into find it just because developers choose to use JSONs instead of XML. If you don't pass XMLs in your code, you're not vulnerable to um, to XXC. And when you talk about cross-site scripting, which used to be one of the biggest vulnerabilities back in the day, today it still exists, but today it's the responsibility of the clients to prevent uh, cross-site scripting uh, because when the servers, today APIs return a, a JSON, not HTML. And if the server returns JSON, it's not the responsibilities to filter for, a, for HTML tags. But there's also bad news. So APIs become a very attractive target for attackers. And there are different reasons why. First of all, APIs expose a much larger attack surface. So instead of having just a few pages, you know, home page and profile page, today you have dozens of API endpoints that replace them. Because uh, the clients became much more specific about what they want, it requires the engineers on the backend to, do, to expose more endpoints. The second point is that APIs are oversharing. APIs expose less abstraction layers and they're also very predictable. So it makes it, makes it much easier for the front-end engineers or other engineers to communicate with the APIs, but the predictable and oversharing nature of REST APIs also open a door for attackers uh, to attack and understand better the APIs in order to, to exploit it. So after seeing all these changes, it led me to start the OWASP API project together with RSA alone from Checkmarks. And we basically uh, compiled a list of the top 10 threats to APIs that are must mo the, the most relevant threats uh, in APIs today. Before I jump into the list, I want to talk to you about the biggest challenge in APIs, which is authorization. And authoriz like in every, almost every API uh, a breach that you read about in the news, you can smell some sense of some type of authorization problem access control or authorization problem. 
it became the biggest challenge to Blaine APIs and it's really hard to solve it. And it took me some time to figure out why, what makes authorization such a big deal. I believe there are two main reasons. First of all, if you think about it, uh, unlike other security mechanisms, uh, authorization, it's very decentralized. So for example, if we talk about authentication, it usually exists in one or a few places in the code and the application. You know, you have a few different ways to authenticate, but it's only a few places. When we talk about authorization, it exists in so many places in the code. When we talk about functional authorization, it could be done in the code, in the configuration, and sometimes even in the API gateway itself. If we talk about authorization in the object level, uh, which is where things become even more interesting, almost every controller uh, in the code that receives an ID from the, from the client needs to perform auth uh, object or authorization checks which is, it means that you have so many places to make mistakes as a developer when you develop your author authorization mechanism. The second part is that today you have much more types of users, roles, and hierarchies between them. So for example, you can find an app that you have this user, this guy, Jack, that uh, belongs to two different groups. He is a driver and an admin at the same time. Or maybe you have a rider that has two sub users. It's very common to find it in um, uh, in apps of health providers that you can create like a sub patient account uh, to your uh, to your family or something like that. Uh, so it creates a situation that you have one account that have a few sub accounts, right? It makes it much harder to create policies to this type of uh, complex users and roles hierarchies. So after talking about in a high level about authorization, let's jump into the number one threat in APIs today. This is the number one on the list. It's called BOLA, Broken Object Level Authorization. You might know this issue as uh, insecure, direct object uh, insecure Direct Object Access, which is IDOR. Um, but we decided to change the name from uh, IDOR to BOLA because of different reasons. Um, but let's try to understand what happens when someone exploits BOLA in your API. So here you can see the lift up. And after you take a ride, you want to rate the trip and to say, oh, it was a great trip. I want to give it five stars. So you just click on the five stars. But behind the scenes, what happens, your client would send an API call to the API endpoint of API slash trips slash rate trip. But the thing is, because you have taken many different rides on your, uh, in, you know, since you opened your account, the client has to mention which ride you want to update. In this case, it's the it's the ride number 718492. Uh, this is the unique identifier of the ride that you want to update. And it's very common to see those IDs, those object IDs, uh, sent from clients to servers in APIs. Uh, and what happens when an API is vulnerable to BOLA is that the developers that develop the API, take the ID as is and update the information of the, of the record in the database without checking that this ID actually belongs to you as a user, which can lead to a situation where you can easily, as an attacker, I could write a script to enumerate all the IDs of all the rides on Uber and to rate all of them with uh, zero stars, for example. This is just one example how I can exploit BOA. Uh, let's see a more interesting example which is, uh, it's a vulnerability found by the security researcher Anand Prakash from AppSecure. He found a very interesting vulnerability that allowed him to gain full access to all the accounts on Uber, both for riders and drivers. So basically he found an API endpoint that's called get consent screen details, as you can see on the left side. And he saw that the API endpoint contains, the request to the endpoint contains a, a user ID, which is the unique identifier of the user. And the response contains a bunch of details about this user, including the email address and even authentication token. Um, so what happens if you, if you use this application as a normal user with no malicious intentions, you would just send the user ID of yourself. But then I'm asking yourself, what would happen if I exploit BOLA and change the ID to an ID of another user? And you were surprised to find to find out 
that the response actually contains information about a different user in the Uber app, including those indication token uh, of the other user. So he could log in on behalf of the other user and to steal into information and to do anything that he wants with the other user. So it's a very critical vulnerability, as you can imagine the potential impact if he was on the bad side. Um, and what happened here basically is the developer that wrote this API uh, in Uber forgot to validate that this ID belongs to the user. And this is a very common vulnerability. Let's jump into number three, excessive data exposure. Personally, it's probably my favorite vulnerability because as a pen tester, instead of like uh, performing complex pen tests and think about very complex scenarios, API is just like PII by design. You can just get access to information of other users without exploiting anything, without sending any malicious payload. It sounds kind of weird, right? Uh, but this is the reality. Many times API endpoints just expose information of other users. So let's see what happens behind the scenes. Let's try to understand why, why it happens today. So a good example to, to talk about excessive data exposure would be a dating app. So I'm in New York, I just swipe on, on some dating app, Tinder or something like that. And then I see the profile of Bob and I can see all the public information about Bob, including the profile picture, the name and his hobbies, which is okay, right? Because I'm supposed to be able to, to access this information as a user of the dating app. But what happens if you take a look behind the scenes in the communication between the client and the API, you could find that the API would send this API call to slash users slash 717 just to fetch the data of this user. And the API response contains all the public information, but also the private address of Bob, which is a very sensitive information. This is a very common pattern. And what happens here is that developers of the API in the backend rely on the developers in the front end to filter out this information on the client side. And they actually do it because as a regular user, if you don't sniff the traffic, you don't see the private address of Bob. But this is a very bad idea because as an attacker, even as a script kitty, it's super easy to just sniff the traffic between the client and the API and to see all of this sensitive information flowing. Uh, a recent example from uh, another dating app for, uh, for swingers, uh, this, is, this was found by Alex Lomas from Pentest Partners. So Alec was curious about the APIs of this application. And what he saw is once you want to see the users around you and to find a potential partner, the API send the mobile client sends an API call to the endpoint of get match users. And the response contains information about users around you. And on top of the public information, you can also find very sensitive information like their birthday, uh, their like private photos that they want they don't want to share with anyone, uh, and even even their specific location. So this API response contains a specific location of the user. Uh, the next thing that Alex did was just to write a script to see all the different users that use the app around the White House. So it's pretty interesting to see how many users, how many active users they have. Let's jump into vulnerability number five, which is broken function level authorization. This is a vulnerability that happens uh, also in the field of authorization and access control. So what happens in many cases that an API would have sub APIs. So you might have one main API, but then you can see you have the admin API, the writer's API and the driver's API. And which one of them should be accessed by a different group of users, right? So if you, you as an attacker, uh, sorry, you have like an admin account and then the admin uh, logs in into the admin panel and wants to delete a specific user. This is uh, a functionality that should be exposed to admins, right? Admins should be able to delete a specific user. So the, uh, the API call behind the scenes would be delete slash users slash 717. And this is fine, this is a legit API call. But what, what happens if an attacker would mimic the same API call 
to delete slash user slash 717. In many cases, the developers don't validate that this user actually belongs to the, to the admin group. And this is where a buffer happens and an attacker could access admin functions that he shouldn't be able to access. And in this case, as you can imagine, the impact is pretty bad and the attacker could just delete all the users on the app. This is just another example for authorization problem in API for, for one type of authorization problems in APIs. It's also very common. And a, a good example for it was as part of a bug bounty, uh, the security researcher uh, UZ Sunny uh, gained $2,000 on bounty on Hacker One because he was able to find an API endpoint on Shopify. Uh, basically allowed him to assign himself as a collaborator for any store on Shopify. And collaborator is a user uh, with very high privileges. And what happened is that the, uh, the developers didn't properly check what type of what type was the existing account. Um, let's jump and talk about mass assignment. Mass assignment is a tricky vulnerability. Uh, it's, I think it's the, le it's the least intuitive one to understand. So let's try to go to see what happens when you have a mass assignment. So I'm going to give you two examples for, a, for code. On the left side, you can see what happens on the traditional applications when the developers want to create a new user. So they would create local variables for first name, last name, and password. They would take the input from the user, which is the query parameter that is sent in the URL, and assign them to the local variables, and then just save the new object of the user. On the left side, you can see what, ha what used to happen in the past, um, which is less common today. This, this technique is less common today. Usually what developers uh, are doing today, in order to save time, they use uh, something that's called mass assignment as a feature, not as a vulnerability, and they basically take the the full json object from the user and instead of parsing it and like saving it into different uh, uh, local variables they just take the json as is and save it as a new object in the database this is some black magic by the orm environment it's very common to see developers using it and uh, what happens it, it saves developers a bunch of time because instead of like writing a, a dozen lines of code they can just use one line of code but it also opens the door for a, a critical vulnerability of mass assignment. So let's see what would happen in a mass assignment exploit. Basically, the problem is that developers don't validate that the a JSON object sent from the client actually contains param parameters that the client is supposed to edit. And if there is no validation, it means that maybe the attacker uh, could assign himself properties is not supposed to access. So for example, a, a legit API call would be API slash users slash new, and then you can see the username and password, but then a malicious API call would uh, include an additional par uh, parameter of uh, role equals admin. And this is where uh, the attacker could assign himself as an admin to the, um, to the API. This is what happens when developers use mass assignment and don't validate that the user should be able to access these properties. An example from uh, James Kettle from Port Swigger, basically an API call on a new relic uh, that allowed him to gain free access to to the new relic, uh, like um, to the new relic API that you're supposed to pay for, which is the API access. So he found there is an API endpoint of post slash account slash account ID. And then there, are two there is one parameter that should be sent to this API endpoint, which is just to edit your first name. But then James tried to inject this uh, another parameter of allow API access equals true. This is an internal property. It shouldn't be able to add to be changed by the user itself, but the API was vulnerable to mass assignment but because the developers wanted to save time. Uh, and James was able to uh, give himself free access to the API. So I wanna talk with you about injections. And the thing about injections is that we change the, the location in the list. 
injections for many years, if you take a look at the older OSP list, used to be always number one. And we changed from number one to number eight. And many people ask me, you know, why do you think that injections aren't really relevant anymore to, in, in APIs? So what I usually answer is to ask, I ask back, why injections was A1 at the first place? So the main reason is because of SQL injection. Uh, there are many types of injections, but uh, SQL injection is by far the most common one, more than all the others. And this is what led uh, injections to be always the most critical vulnerability. Um, and today, SQL injections are much less common because of, as we discussed, ORM environments, there are so many security products that solve them, and also the use of NoSQL. These, these are some of the main reasons why uh, SQL injections are less common today. Um, this is true that no SQL injections exist, uh, they're a thing, but they are not as severe or as common as SQL injection. If you go to Hacker One and you go to the Hacktivity page, which shows you all the um, different uh, reports on Hacker One with an option to search for something, you could see that uh, if you look for SQL injection, you would find a bunch of vulnerabilities, but if you look for no SQL injection, you would find very few. Um, let's jump into A9, which is improper asset management. Uh, this is not a very sexy vulnerability, to be honest, but it's very important. Uh, it's more like a housekeeping type of vulnerability. So it has two subcategories. The first one is where you can find API endpoint that has no documentation. So you have one API with three different endpoints, a get user, public location, both of them are uh, documented, developers wrote uh, a documentation for it, and you can know that they exist. But then you have this uh, third endpoint of uh, v0 slash b2b old export old users. This is an endpoint that has no documentation. The developers just forgot to write uh, documentation for it. Maybe the developer was on a rush, he didn't have the time. Uh, and this is where uh, you can find API endpoints that has no documentation. Nobody knows about this endpoint and it makes it very dangerous. The second type of uh, improper asset management is unknown API hosts or even completely environments that, uh, that are forgotten. So many times I, I, when I perform pen tests for companies, I would go, I would scan all their assets on the internet and then I would see something like uh, QA-3 old uh, dot company name dot com, and I would I would go to the DevOps team or to the engineers and ask them, hey, what what is this? Uh, what's the story about this this uh, API host about this microservice? And they would tell me, we have no idea. Someone uh, someone someone like uh, set it up a few years ago. He left the company, but we are too afraid to to remove it. So. It's very common to see that micro, like undocumented microservices, API hosts um, in, in these type of companies, oh, to be honest, almost every company. I think the reality today is that it makes it, it's like um, the cloud environment and all the CICD uh, thing makes it much easier to, to spin up a new microservice, to spin up a new, a new host, uh, to spin up even a whole new environment. So developers and DevOps engineers just spin up many of those and sometimes they forget about uh, some of them uh, which leads to the second aspect of uh, improper asset management and the reality is that in those undocumented api hosts many times this is the most attractive target for attackers uh, because they are less likely to be updated uh, they are less likely to have security mechanisms uh, turned on for example a common example that i like to, to talk about is that in Facebook, someone was able to bypass the rate limiting of Facebook. Like once you once you try to reset your password, uh, you need to like to send a secret token to the API, and basically Facebook implements a mechanism to to block you after five attempts. If you are trying like five calls and they're like uh, they're bad, uh, you're gonna be blocked. But then Facebook had this beta API. Uh, that shares the same database, uh, but because it was like kind of a niche API, nobody uh, enabled the rate limiting. Uh, this is why it's very important to document those unknown API hosts and also the unknown API endpoints. Uh, it's really important to keep on track with your APIs. 
um, I would just mention that this, the left side of this one is something that should be done by developers, while the right side is something that should be done by the DevOps. Um, I'll move it over to Anoop right now, and then we'll have time for, uh, for questions. All right, sounds good. So I'll start sharing my screen over here in a second. So bear with me while I start sharing. Um, okay, so just very, very quickly, um, I've been, uh, in terms of intro, I, like I mentioned, uh, I'm going to be showing you a quick little uh, snapshot, a quick little demo of the traceable platform. Um, want to provide sort of a teaser um, maybe we can have a much more detailed conversation, a one-on-one -on -one conversation after you see this teaser, right? So uh, as part of this teaser demo, call it what we want, we'll be walking you through the typical experience of a application developer, an application DevOps person, even a SecOps person to be able to use this platform as they go about uh, deploying the application through its entire life cycle, right? all the way from pre-prod uh, in staging, in dev, test environments, uh, to using the application in production environments and then securing the application using this platform. And then using, uh, again, leveraging the platform for day-to-day -day operations as well. Now, there's a variety of different ways in which you can integrate this platform into your application infrastructure. But once it's been deployed, the primary goal, the first sort of goal that the platform starts off with is in discovering all of your assets, all of your applications, your distributed microservices. Um, again, we want to be completely agnostic to the underlying infrastructure, which basically means that you could be running your applications on bare metal servers or VMs in the traditional world. You could be running in... Uh, the modern sort of DevOps world as distributed microservices running and breathing in uh, public cloud environments on top of uh, Kubernetes infrastructure uh, or even serverless infrastructure should not really matter, right? Once the platform, once the traceable platform itself has been integrated, we'll be able to go in and discover all of your assets and tell you exactly how those assets are communicating with each other as well. As you can see over here, we'll give you sort of a high level application topology map. But from this map, you can then go in and decide which component looks interesting to you, which part of the application looks interesting to you. Dig down deeper into that particular component and see all the specifics, such as how healthy that component is, what's the latency, what's the error count, what's the call rate, how that component is speaking to the rest of the world, who is speaking to it. All of those details are contextualized and presented to you. We'll also be able to answer questions, questions around what makes up that microservice, what makes up that application, as in what are the APIs, what are the API endpoints, what are the access methods that are used for accessing those API endpoints. Um, and believe it or not, just like Inan mentioned, the uh, the challenges around uh, around improper asset management around excessive data exposure. That's something that we see e each and every one of our prospects experiencing firsthand as well, right? So as part of deploying our platform, about 95% of the time, and I'm being conservative when I say this, but 95% of the time, we end up discovering APIs or API endpoints that many of our customers, many of our prospects were not even aware of, right? So that's sort of a big win right on day zero, literally deploying the platform. But from there, just by observing the traffic that's going in and out of these APIs, we are also able to give you, assess the risk associated with these applications, right? What's the data exposure? Uh, what's the types of PII data that might be exposed? Is there excessive PII being exposed? Um, who are the users? What are the IPs? Are these APIs externally exposed? Are these APIs authenticated or unauthenticated? Those are the questions that the risk score effectively answers for you. Again, 
literally zero touch as soon as you deploy the platform you have an evaluation of the risk you have an evaluation of the threat associated with exposing these apis along with a live catalog of the apis like i said uh, uh discovering things that you were not even aware of right so that's the day zero value typically comes out of just deploying our platform in pre-prod now once we have discovered these assets we then start associating users who might be accessing these assets as well and also how these applications are interacting with the rest of the universe the rest of the environment so once we have discovered the application topology and the users who are accessing these assets we start baselining what is normal behavior across the entire infrastructure and once we have that comprehensive baseline we are able to identify your mischievous users your bad actors your threat actors who might be lingering in your environment and this might be these bad actors could very well be drive-by scanners that are identified based on their ip addresses or they could very well be authenticated users right it's so easy for anyone to log in and authenticate themselves with your platform, register themselves as a regular user. But just because they are a regular user doesn't mean they cannot do anything mischievous, right? Um, they could log in, they could authenticate, they could register with your application, and then they can start slowly applying or, or trying to do reconnaissance across the application, trying to farm for sensitive data, maybe try to access some other user's data. And that's exactly what we are this platform is designed to identify as well. So you'll see the authenticated users identified based on their user ID. And these users could very well, like I said, could be doing something mischievous, could be doing something malicious. Everything that the user has attempted in terms of malicious behavior gets recorded, can be proactively blocked using this platform and it's presented to you in the form of the storyboard a time sequenced set of activities which tell you exactly what the user has done since the beginning of time since they have registered with the application and those mischievous malicious things could be your regular sort of application security sort of things like someone trying to do a path traversal someone trying to do a remote command injection things that can be identified by patterns, things that can be identified by signatures, but it could also be things that are very, very unique to the application. Behavioral sort of zero day attacks where you have a user, in this case, we have this user who's trying to access objects that might belong to a completely different user. Uh, how can you identify these types of attacks? There is no way in this whole wide world for any, tool, any security tool to be able to identify these types of attacks without having an intimate understanding of the business logic of the application, uh, to, without really having a comprehensive baseline of what is normal behavior. And that's exactly what the traceable platform is designed to help you with. Understand baselines and identify those users who might be trying to do things that are very, very unique to exploit the business logic of the application. And once the user has been identified, obviously you can take action against that user, which basically means you can go in, block that particular user, um, suspend it for a specific amount of time while you are sort of evaluating whether this is a real threat or not, and things like that, right? So that's sort of the first level of incident response, so to speak. You're going in, the knee-jerk reaction is to block the user, but then, the, the, the other thing that comes out of this detection is that, hey, I want to evaluate whether this user got access to any confidential data. Did they get, did they scan for PII data? Did they touch any critical assets across my compliance environment, as an example? All of those uh, details are captured as part of the platform as well. You can see exactly how the user came in, what were the sequence of API calls that were executed, along with the API that actually got hacked. You can take it one step further. And I'm talking about this as, as if this is matter of fact. But believe me, there is, I've been in API security for a while. So I would, I would ask you 
to to look for tools that give you this level of visibility, right? And then from there, if you want to evaluate exactly what were the things that were touched by this particular user through this particular session, there's also a data lake that comes with the platform where you can go in and do very contextual application level searches where you can go in and say, hey, I want to see all the actions that were executed by a particular user for this particular session. And these searches are being applied, not against logs, but actual traces, right? Where you can see, and this is something that blows everyone's mind because now you can see the exact sequence of API calls that were made, that were executed by a user for, through a particular session, how long a particular user spent on a API endpoint and what were the sequence of API calls that were executed by that user to eventually, eventually hack into that API, right? So not only do you, are you able to identify the bad actors, you can literally without writing any complex correlation rules, right? You can literally rewind the clock and see the exact set of actions that were executed. Sort of like a, I'm probably dating myself, sort of like a DDR, right? So all in all, what we built for you is this, is this consolidated platform, right? That starts off with giving you very comprehensive visibility, assess risk around your assets, around your applications, around your microservices, regardless of where they are running. From there, we'll start protecting your applications in production. And God forbid something happens in your environment, then you have this very rich contextualized data lake where you can go in and slice and dice the data, do postmortem analysis, threat anal analytics, advanced even threat hunting um, uh, on top of everything else that you receive, right? So that's pretty much all I had in terms of a teaser. Um, Passing it on to you, uh, Inan, uh, and any questions, any questions, feel free to pose it on chat. Uh, I would welcome the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Uh, and in terms of evaluating the platform itself, we can even do a security assessment in your environment for free. So which basically means that you'll be able to a, discover assets, APIs, applications that are part of your environment as part of evaluating the platform. And also as part of the security assessment, we might even be able to uncover some vulnerabilities that you were not even aware of from a business logic, from an API perspective. 90% of the time we end up discovering bolas. So uh, let's throw it out there. It's so, so common like uh, Inan mentioned. Um, Inan, do you see any questions, man? Uh, nope, I don't see any questions. Okay, all right. I guess I was so crystal clear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, again, um, happy to have a one on one conversation with you. Uh, and like I said, as part of evaluating the platform, what you get for free is a um, real time catalog and maybe some vulnerabilities that will blow your mind. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anoop. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.